uh, we are going to uh, move into our message portion uh, this morning. In India, we know of a large hunger problem among the people. Uh, Many people donate money to the cause to help people get food uh, that they need, which of course is not wrong, it is very helpful. However, India does not have a hunger problem specifically because of a lack of food. The Hindu religion teaches reincarnation in the form of animals, and so it is against religious laws to kill rats, mice, cows, and other animals. Every cow eats enough food to feed about seven people. And there are 200 million sacred cows in India. If the people of India would just stop feeding these cows, they would have enough to feed over 1 billion people. And that is more than one-fourth of the entire world's population. Now, I bring this up to help us understand that some people do things to hold to their religions. And it is interesting what people do in their religions just because they believe that they have to. Now, if we look at Christianity, there are many people who think that they have to do many things in order to be a Christian. And most of the time, people put requirements on themselves that are simply not necessary or helpful in their walk with God. Today, we're in our second week of our series in the book of Colossians, a series I've entitled, Set Your Mind on Christ. Over the next few weeks, I just encourage you to crack open the Bible and read through the entire book of Colossians because it is a short book. It is only four chapters. Uh, In my Bible, it actually only covers three pages of my Bible and just a little bit more of a fourth page. So it's very short, but I want us to really get our minds into this. No pun intended of here because it's Set Your Mind on Christ. And uh, our, our brother Tom would, would say, every pun is intended. <laughs> so that was, I guess, an intended pun. But set your mind on Christ. Set your mind into the book of Colossians and help yourself understand more of this by simply reading this. And as you do that, you'll know what's being preached about on Sunday mornings and just kind of give you a little bit of, a, of, a, of an example of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, Colossians is a book, as I mentioned last week, written by Paul. And he also gives credit to Timothy here in this introduction that he gives in Colossians 1. Paul is writing to a church in Colossae, and he is in prison as he writes this book. We call this the Colossian church because these folks live in Colossae. So recognize here, too, that he is not writing to all of the people who live in Colossae. He's writing to the church that is in Colossae. So I just want us to understand that this morning, and it's very important as we look at biblical interpretation, who the original author was originally intending the message for. That helps us to better understand the message so that we can apply it to our life. Here at Byesville Assembly of God, one of our core values that we've mentioned quite a bit is biblical lifestyle. It's over on the wall over there, biblical lifestyle. And the statement that goes along with that is this, biblical lifestyle, which means that we desire to help all people experience heart transformation by growing in their knowledge and understanding of the Bible and reflect a godly life of integrity and evangelism through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And you think, wow, that's a mouthful. It is. But if you want a copy of that, I'll give it to you, because if you look very intently into that specific statement, it really lays out why we focus on the Bible, why this is a part of who we are, and the fact that we don't want to just have a knowledge of the Bible, but we want to allow it to change our lives so that we can more reflect Christ instead of living like people in this world. So when I mention different principles of biblical interpretation, they are important to us because we desire to live lives based off the Bible. So as we look at those ideas and impart them into Colossians, Paul begins by his standard introduction in the first chapter of wishing grace and peace to the Colossian church. Paul wrote many books in the Bible, and he would often introduce the the books by, first of all, saying, I am Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. But then he would often also say, grace and peace to you. Grace and peace to you. Paul wrote to encourage them in their faith. That's why he wrote to them. They were seemingly doing really well in their faith in God. And Paul 
wrote to them. So, Colossians chapter 2 is where we'll be today. I'll be reading the entire chapter of Colossians 2 to start. It will not be on the screen to start, but as we move on in the next portions of the message, it will be on the screen. So, um, you will have to follow along on your device. You can go on the YouVersion Bible app. Our message notes are in there. Just go to the More tab, the Events tab, and then search our church's name, and you'll have all of our sermon notes for this very morning. If you don't like that, you're fine. We love you. Grab your paper, paper Bible right in front of you, and we'll start right in Colossians 2 in the English Standard Version, ESV. Let's take it up right in Colossians 2. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of knowledge and wisdom. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in the body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Verse 6, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority." In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through the faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. Verse 20, and finishing up here. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, Why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Quote, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Let's pray this morning. God, Today, we desire to know your word. And God, as we look into your word, I pray that you would reveal to us the message that we need to know today. We pray, Lord, that the word of God comes flying off the page and into our hearts. We pray for Holy Spirit inspiration as we read and understand today. And I pray, Lord, if there's any way that I've prepared that's different from what you wanted to be spoken, I pray, Lord, that you would give that to me and that I would be faithful to speak that. Help us to all understand your word by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the first few verses we'll focus on today is Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Let's reread that today for context. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. Point number one is assurance in Christ. He mentions here, Paul does, that he struggles for the Colossians and those at Laodicea, meaning that he is praying intently for these people that they would continue to know Christ. He mentioned that in the first chapter. 
I pray for you, I pray without ceasing. Yes, we understand that. But he's still praying here and still talking about the fact that he continues to pray. And he says, how great a struggle I have for you in prayer. He wants them to continue to know Christ. He's praying so intently that he calls it a struggle. A struggle. It is believed that both, that both in Colossae and Laodicea that there were teachers of false teaching that were arising. And Paul wanted them to stay on the right course. He didn't want them to get distracted in their faith. I think that's the heart of every pastor. He wants the people in that flock to serve God and not be distracted. Paul mentions that he has not seen them face to face. So what that tells us is that he never was with the Colossians when he was writing this letter, or even before that. It's interesting to me. Jameson Fawcett Brown commentary suggests that Paul could be praying so intently with a struggle because he wishes that he could have met the Colossians, and he wishes that he could have been with them during their lifetime in some way, shape, or form. But he wanted to be with the Colossians and Laodiceans so much and encourage them in person, but because he couldn't be, he's almost making up for that lack of face time by praying fervently and without ceasing. And I'm not talking about the FaceTime on your phones. I'm talking about the person-to-person -person actual FaceTime. He doesn't want them to be distracted from the faith. He wants them to reach full assurance, full assurance of what Christ has done for them. You can have a full assurance in your faith in Christ. Did you know that? You can have full assurance in your faith in Jesus Christ. And know Him as your Lord and Savior and not wonder when you die if you'll go to heaven or not. You'll know for sure that you have relationship with Jesus and you'll go to heaven. I thank God for full assurance in my faith in Christ. Not because of things I've done. I couldn't even control whether I go to heaven or not by my own actions and words and everything. I'm too sinful. I'm too awful. I'm too bad. And that's why I needed Christ. But I have full assurance in Christ, not because of what I've done. I have full assurance in my salvation because I am so confident in what Christ has done and the work that he did on the cross and that he rose from the dead and now he's seated at the right hand of God in heaven that I have full assurance of my faith in Christ because I serve a God who did it. So I put my faith in him so I can have assurance in him. When you have Jesus Christ in your heart, and you ask Him to forgive you of your sins and ask Him to be the Lord and Savior of your life, you don't have to doubt. You don't have to think, I wonder where I would go if I died today. You could have full assurance. And God's grace extends to you as you have that full assurance and you don't have doubt. You know, so many people doubt their faith because they feel uneasy in their faith journey. You ever gone through a time in your life where you just kind of feel uneasy in faith and une uneasy in circumstances? And, you know, some people feel that when those times come that they're out of God's will. Some pe and sometimes you might be, by the way. Sometimes you might be living a life contrary to what God wants you to live. But I would say that if you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior and you're walking in Him and then you have an uneasy feeling like, eh, I don't know if I can trust in God. If that thought ever comes to mind, you could debunk that. Because you can trust in God, you can trust in Christ. And it's not because of the work you've done, it's because of the work that He has already done for you. Some people feel that when they're tempted, that they've sinned and now they're separated. It's important to note here that temptation is not sin. Temptation is not sin. Moving forward with that temptation is sin. But the actual temptation is not sin. So we will have difficult times that come up in life. We will have temptations that come up and we have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us as Christians to combat against the things of the enemy. We have assurance in our faith as Paul describes. Amen? Colossians 2, 6, and 7 says this, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith just as you were taught abounding in thanksgiving. Point number two is walk in Christ. We touched on this a little bit last week, but Paul discusses this again. I would assume here that you could recognize he thinks this is very important. 
So he talks about it again. When you accept Christ, that doesn't mean that you go back to the way that you were living before. Amen? Paul says in Romans that we should not continue to sin just so that we can experience more of God's grace. You ever been taken advantage of? I think all of us at one point in time in our life have been taken advantage of. And you sit there and you say, oh, that's not fair. That's not nice. That's wrong. We can all recognize that when someone wrongs us, it's not fun. It's not right. When we get taken advantage of, it's not good. And so why does the church feel like we can just keep sinning so that we can go back to more of God and more of grace? How do you think that the creator of the universe feels as we continue to sin just so that we can come back and experience more grace? Now, God is gracious, and if you fall and make a mistake, He is gracious to bring you back into the fold, but it's all about your heart. And if you have a heart that says, I'm going to sin so that I can get more grace and be forgiven, that's not what it's all about. That's taking advantage of the situation, and that's not how it works. You know, that's not even a healthy relationship in real life either. Sinning to receive more grace is like a husband who cheats on his wife because he remembers the vows that his wife said to him on his wedding day. The husband thinks he can go out and cheat on his wife because she vowed that she would be with him until the day that they die. Quote, till death do us part. That's taking advantage of the love and grace that the wife committed to, and that's not how a healthy relationship works. Paul says, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. Walk in Him. Don't stray to the right. Don't stray to the left. You might be thinking, that's not the right and the left. This is your right, and this is your left. I did that on purpose. You see, very good, right? But don't stray to the right or the left. Don't let your emotions take over you and make you do things that you'll regret. Don't let anger take control over you. Don't, take, don't let the circumstances that surround you control you and put you in a spot that you're not walking in Christ anymore. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Because trust me, I've done that. And it's not worth it to step out of walking with Christ to take care of an emotional issue that I'm, that I'm getting upset over, that I don't need to be getting upset over, it's not worth it. And I know it takes some training because in the moment, emotions can overwhelm you and you want to do whatever it is because you think that reacting the way that you react will solve the problem. But if reacting the way that you are reacting means that you have to not walk in Christ anymore, then maybe you should review how you're handling situations. Because that's not walking in Christ. No matter the circumstance, choose. Choose. It's a choice. Choose to walk in Christ. Hannah and I are coming up on almost six years of marriage uh, coming up in June. S so excited that she married me. I'm still excited. <laughs> oh, man. And she puts up with me. I love her so much. So great. Love her to pieces. But I tell you, before our wedding day, the day before our wedding... June 9th, 2017, I had an aunt who came up and spoke in front of all. We had what's called a blessing dinner. Instead of doing a, a, a formal, uh, what do you call that, rehearsal dinner, right? We, we didn't do a rehearsal dinner. Instead, we invited um, 100 of our closest family, friends, influences that were in our life, and we just let them come and, and share any memories that they had from us and everything and anything that encouragement that they wanted to say to us. It was so cool. It was awesome. I loved it. But I had an aunt that, that got up and said, Dustin, Hannah, I want you to know that, you know, I, I understand you love each other. You guys are just, you know, the emotions are high. You're getting married tomorrow. Everything's amazing and all the flutter bugs in your tummy and everything, whatever. You know. So she went on all about that. She said, the emotions are high right now, but she said, just so you know, there will be some days that come up in your marriage when the emotions aren't there anymore, which was really hard for me to comprehend at that moment, but anyone who's married understands there's some days that get hard, and so what she said was, Dustin there's, and Hannah, she said, there's some days that you're going to have to choose to love each other. 
you're going to have to choose to love each other, even in times that it's really difficult, when all the butterflies in your tummy aren't there on a given day, and she's upset at you at something, or you're upset at her about something, there comes a moment when you've got to choose to love that spouse. That stuck with me, and I'm grateful for that. And then she had a grandfather who got up and said, you know my favorite part about conflicts in marriage? He said, making up. (laughs) He said, so no matter what happens, make up, get right with your spouse. Don't let a day go by while you're angry, right? I remember those things, and it's the same thing in here in our walk with Christ. You have to choose to walk in Him, and when, you're, when you have emotions that are high, you'll go through times that you don't want to walk in Christ. You want to step off of the path and say, no, I want to do it my way. I want to handle it with my emotions, but you can find a way to walk in Christ and handle your emotions at the same time. They do merge. Only God shows you how to do it. And I can only tell you it comes through messing up enough times. And then God will continue to teach you how to continue to walk in Christ no matter what happens. Will you mess up? Yes, you will. And so when you do, not if you do, but when you do, ask God for forgiveness. Ask Him to help you. If you've hurt someone in the process, or maybe you've hurt your own self in the process and reacting or whatever and walking out of Christ, go ask forgiveness. Make it right. Don't let a day drag on and expect to receive grace like we were just talking here. Expect to receive grace when you've taken advantage of it. Paul encourages to walk in Christ and root yourself in Christ. That's another term he used here is root yourself in Christ. You know, you know how strong a tree root can be. Okay, we understand how much they go in the ground. The roots are deep. Um, we were just taking a walk the other day through Byesville and we saw a, a tree that we totally believe has to be going straight through the foundation and into the basement of that home, (laughs) okay? You know, we've we've seen homes like that, such a huge tree and it's sideways going against the house. I'm thinking, there is no foundation. (laughs) There can't be. But those roots are deep, so deep that it's a wonder how some of them are dug up. I remember a few years back when we lived down here in in this parsonage and uh, and I had some bushes I was taking out. In fact, uh, my friend Cameron, Pastor Joe Sonny, he's here today and he helped me with that. You remember that day, right? That was an awful day. I had had, uh, taken up as much of the bush as I could and we got to a point that, okay, we're at surface level now, let's start digging. So we're digging, we're digging, we're digging, we're digging. Oh, I got about four feet down we did before we said, you know what? We're just going to call it a day. We cut it off about four feet down. We covered that up with dirt and said that shouldn't come up for another 10 years or so. And we're just going to be fine with that. Um, Those roots are deep. They get really far down. And sometimes they get so deep that there's nothing you can do to shake that root. And you know, that makes for a strong tree. That makes for a strong plant. Our faith in Christ should be the same. Everything we do should be an outflow of the root that we have in Christ. Out of the time that we are spending time with God, we should be so deeply rooted in Christ that not even cutting off the top like an avalanche, that not even cutting off the top can shake that from having a continued growth in Christ no matter what happens. And one day, that bush is going to come back up, (laughs) and it is going to be quite a joy to face that again, I'm sure of it. But that root is still there. And you know, as we are rooted in Christ, we can make a decision to continue to honor Him. Colossians 2.8 continues on. See to it, Paul says, that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Paul gives us a warning against deceit here. Point number three is warning against deceit. As we talked about, when our roots are deep in Christ, we have less of a chance to deviate away from the truth of God's word when someone speaks something against the truth of the Bible. Paul warns the Colossians to not be taken captive by philosophy and empty deceit. He knew that many lies were spreading about God's word, and he wanted to combat against these things by telling them, hold true to Christ. Hold true to Christ. Now, along with this, I will say it is very important to have a certain knowledge of opposing views to Christianity. We've we got to understand about that because of the fact that people that you might be talking with, people that you might be sharing Christ with are coming 
to the gospel from all sorts of religions. And because of this, we should know what they believe in part so that we can do our part to understand where they are coming from so that we can effectively reach them more effectively with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In my schooling for my undergrad for a major in Bible and theology, we had a class called Introduction to Islam, and we, we went all into what the Islam religion is all about. And uh, it's interesting because the more I dug deep into some of the roots of Islam, they use some of the same wordings and some of the, some, but not all, it is against Christianity for sure, but they use some of the same scriptures, and so therefore there could be some folks who truly believe that that is the way to God and that is the way to freedom. And so knowing that, it gave me a better idea of how to reach someone who is of the, the Islam religion, someone who is a Muslim, gave me a better idea of how to reach them for Christ so that I could say, hey, in the Quran it says this, but in the Bible it says this, and there is freedom in Jesus. And I had an opportunity a few years back when I was in Florida on a trip to, uh, to visit with a man who I was in line to get ice cream with or something like that, and uh, he, he was a Muslim. And I told him I was a Christian here for a Christian conference. I said, tell me about your religion, because I had already been through the class. I said, tell me about your faith. And he was kind of nervous. He said, well, I mean, I'm, I'm Muslim. I said, okay, tell me about that. And he was very caught off guard because he knew I was a Christian. I said, no, tell me this, please. I want, I want to talk to you about this. He said, well, we believe in this and that. I said, okay, tell me more about that. And then I presented to him the gospel and, and shared with him what it means to accept Christ. And uh, it's been like eight years, and I cannot remember if he did accept Christ or not, but I was, I was at least able to sow a seed so that he understands more of who Jesus is, and he felt like he was heard. He felt like he was listened to, and that was really helpful for him. And although it's helpful to know about those belief systems to a certain extent, it's important to not get so sucked in to studying another belief system that you, get, that you begin to discredit the Bible. The, uh, the Bible is the authoritative Word of God. No other book is like it in the history of mankind. Do we recognize that no other book has been proven over again and again other than this one? Not only by prophecies that have come to fruition, yes. Not only in the Christian religion has it been stood the test of time, of course, because people who believe in it are going to continue to believe in it. Why wouldn't they? And why wouldn't they pass it on to their family? Okay, I could see that argument. But that's not even mentioning the fact that it has been proven by science. It has been proven by history. It has been proven by archaeology. You name it, it has been proven. The Bible is the longest standing book that has been proven over and over and over again. And the Jesus that I serve, he, he fulfilled over 300 prophecies just in himself. We talked about that on Easter Sunday. Just in his birth, life, ministry, death, resurrection, ascension into heaven, all these things that he did he proved that he was the Son of God. So I would say, just as Paul does, in the course of your life, don't let people take you captive by philosophy because they will have a nice and convincing argument. They will. And you will get sidetracked on it. But put them up against the Bible, the truth of the Word of God, and you will find that those arguments fail in comparison to the truth that we find in the Bible, the one true Word of God. Paul warns the Colossians not to allow people to distract them from the truth of what Jesus did for them. And the truth of what Jesus did for them is discussed next in what Paul says in Colossians 2, verses 13 through 15. He says this, and you who, let me just preface this again. He's talking about empty deceit. Don't get distracted by false philosophies and teachings and religions, but instead, then he says this, instead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Point number four is alive in Christ. Just in case the Colossians forgot what the truth of Christ was because of possible false teachings, Paul makes it very clear for them. The truth is that each of us were dead in sin. We were dead in our mistakes and our trespasses, but God. Someone say, but God. God. But God made a way. He made a way for us. God made you alive together with Him, and He forgave all your trespasses. We discussed this last week, that the one man who could actually take care of your sins and eliminate them, the one man that could do that 
decided that he would do that. And he did do that. That he would move forward, Jesus did, with paying for your sins. And now you have been set free as you believe in Jesus. I love the next part. As you believe in Jesus, if you've been for, it says you've been forgiven of all of your trespasses. And he did this by canceling the record of debt that stood against you with its legal demands. Aren't you grateful for that? We sang that this morning. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. That's in the song, It Is Well With My Soul, the last one we sang. There is a glorious hope in that. There is a glorious hope, and that gets me every time that he nailed my sin to the cross, and I don't bear it anymore. So today, if you are bearing your sin, if you've asked Christ to forgive you and you still bear your sin, that's not yours to bear anymore. It's not that it will be nailed to the cross. It's that it has been nailed to the cross. And the debt that you think you pay and the debt that you sometimes live in and the guilt that you live in even has been paid for by Jesus on the cross and it's not yours to carry anymore. God has taken care of that. Think of it this way. Because of your sin, you had a record of debt. Think of it as a financial record of debt that had to be paid. And it's as if you owed on a bill that you flat out didn't have the money for. And the due date was yesterday, okay? A lot of us know what that feels like, okay? We understand what that's like, at least at one point in time or another in our life. But it's as if the end of time came and God said, it's time to pay up. You owe this huge bill that you don't even cl have close to the amount of money to pay for. God says, it's time to pay up. But Jesus says, hey, I'm going to cover your bill for you, and I'm going to cover your debt. And you might wonder, why would he even do that? And Jesus would say, because I love you. Because I love you. Well, there's got to be more to it than that. There's got to be. I've been racking my brain for the 27 years I've been alive trying to figure out why would Jesus do that for me? And in the times I've read the Bible, I continue to come back to, he did it because he loves me. So I have to accept that love. And sometimes it's hard because I don't like who I am sometimes. I don't like what I do sometimes. I don't like the way I've lived in the past sometimes, but I have to accept the love that he's given me. The truth of this gospel was a truth that was getting screwed up back in Bible times because people didn't believe that Jesus actually did make this sacrifice. They were spreading rumors that the disciples hid the body of Jesus or that he didn't really die. But did you know that if a Roman officer did not complete the crucifixion of an individual, that they would be held accountable for that action? If they said someone's dead, they surely better be dead according to a Roman officer, or they then would have their life taken on account of that person because they did not kill them and they did not fulfill the command. They would be put to death. So you'd better believe that when those Roman officers killed Jesus, he was dead. He was dead in that tomb. He was dead for sure. So on the third day, we understand that after they threw him in the tomb and on the third day, we celebrated a few weeks ago on Easter Sunday, he's risen from the dead. He's alive. He defeated all the powers of hell. Jesus is risen. The truth of the gospel still remains almost 2,000 years later. And the same offer is then now available to you today to accept Christ into your heart. The same, the same mission that the disciples had when Jesus was on earth and right after he ascended into heaven is the same mission that I have and that you have as well if you are a believer in Jesus, and that is to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and, on, and the Holy Spirit. There's been many things that have happened since Jesus told us to do that and now in 2023, but the mission is still the same. And I've taken up the mantle, and many of you who know Christ have taken up the mantle and said, I'll share Christ with other people. That's the hope that we have, accepting Jesus into our hearts. And you know, that's why we've gathered here today, in part. In part, what we do at church is we edify the saints and encourage those who already know Jesus, but in part, we also give an opportunity for those who don't know Jesus Christ to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. Colossians 2.18 says this, 
Colossians 2.18. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind. Point number five is let no one disqualify you. Uh, There were people back in those days who would practice asceticism. And if the definition for asceticism is on the screen, you can put it on there. If you don't have it, that's fine. I may not have remembered to put it in there. However, I'm going to read it to you today. Asceticism is this, severe self-discipline and avoidance of all forms of indulgence, typically for religious reasons. Asceticism. That's what they were talking about today. Let no one disqualify you in saying, hey, you're not getting involved in asceticism. You're not going through severe self-discipline. See, people would do all sorts of things to look holy and look like they were above someone else in their faith. Oh, I haven't eaten in 63 days. Or I, you know, severely disciplined myself. For some people, it was, it was cutting themselves. I cut myself however many times because of how much I've done wrong against, a, against you know, these gods. And so I've cut myself, and now you need to do that. And they, they said all these types of things to get these people to do all sorts of wrong, evil, bad things that were not helping them in their walk with God, that were literally severe self-discipline that could have even cost them their life if they went too far with some of these things. And they were doing this all the time. People would go on in grave detail about doing this stuff. And, and for, the Christ, for the Colossians, it, Paul is trying to tell them, hey, don't let people say that you've got to do all that stuff. Don't let people tell you you've got to involve yourself in that stuff because that's not the stuff that leads to, to me. That's the stuff that leads to making that person look good and holding those things over your head. And guilt tripping is not welcome in the kingdom of God. Guilt tripping is not welcome in the kingdom of God. And so you may not be involved in asceticism this morning, but you may be involved in something that you've told someone else, hey, you're not doing this, you're awful and bad, you need to do this exactly how I do it because yada, 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 and that's not helping anything either. And so I would encourage you today, if you are a Christian and you know Jesus and you're holding things over other people, then stop it, (laughs) you know, just flat out, don't do that. Uh, Paul says that that's not right. He even says your people would go on in grave detail about visions that they had, and they would tell everybody about these amazing visions that they had and all these things that they were doing for God or all these things that they were hearing from God. Now, here's the thing. It's not bad to talk about what you're hearing from God lately. That's great. In fact, it's really positive to tell people, hey, God spoke this to my heart this week. Trusted mentor or a friend or myself or any, anyone. You, know, you tell them what you've heard from God. That's great. Within reason and within what you feel God is sharing with you to tell other people. But if you're, not, if you're doing that because you want to one-up the other Christian that you're talking to, again, don't do that. Think again about this. God doesn't speak to you so that you look good to other people. God speaks to you to encourage you, to edify you. God speaks to you maybe to encourage somebody else. It's not all about you. It's not. So God doesn't speak to you to make you look good to other people. So use this filter as your guide. You will never have to harm yourself or others to do the will of God. You will never have to harm yourself or others to do the will of God. Asceticism says you've got to do all these things and harm yourself in order to please God, to make up for your sin. I don't know about you, but I serve a Jesus who has already paid for that sin, so I don't need to discipline myself because Jesus took all of that discipline on for me. He paid the price. People were using all forms of self-harm, such as cutting themselves down in their mind or actually legitimately cutting themselves and doing all these sorts of things that they thought were getting them closer to God or making up for their wrongs. But Romans 8, 1 and 2 says... There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the next scripture up here. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. There is no condemnation. You know, there, there is a difference here. When it comes to the Holy Spirit, there is, a, there is conviction and then there's condemnation. Let me tell you what the difference is. Conviction is when you feel bad about the sins that you've done and it leads you to God. And it leads you to ask God for freedom from those things. That's conviction. The Holy Spirit does that. We understand that's one of the workings of the Holy Spirit that we read about in the Bible. He he helps us to feel convicted about our sin because we aren't lining up with the Word of God. And in turn, that 
empowers us to go to God and say, God, I need your help with this. Did you notice that there wasn't any word of guilt in there? Conviction means I, I understand I don't line up with God's word. I'm convicted. I go to God and I ask for forgiveness and he helps me to live my life for him. Here's what condemnation is. Condemnation is I feel bad about the way I live. I'm awful. I'm terrible. And you know what the devil will do? The devil will even tell you, hey, you're not lining up with the word of God. You're pretty bad. You're awful. You're terrible. And you'll start to think that you're a terrible person. And that will start to, you'll start to identify as all those things that are coming to your mind. And I've got to tell you that if you're finding your identity in your sin and you're thinking about that all the time, that's not of God. That's called condemnation. There's guilt in condemnation. And that's a life that is very difficult to live. And I've lived there, I hear you. But you can have freedom in Christ even from the condemnation. Romans says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Don't stay thinking that you must punish yourself for not having a good day spiritually. Listen, we all have hard days. We all have hard days, but they are never so bad that we must think that we're awful, bad, terrible, and, and it leads us to a state of depression and awfulness. No, we have difficult days, but they're never so bad that we have to harm ourselves or anything like that. When it comes to asceticism or all other forms of trying to achieve physical things in order to improve your relationship with God, it just doesn't work. That's not my words. This is Paul. Let me share this with you. The last verse in Colossians 2, verse 23. All these things that we just talked about, he said, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. But they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. People were thinking that if they harmed themselves like this, that it would make them not do it again the next time. Paul said it straight up here. They are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Those things only promote Sell yourself. Those things only are a part of asceticism. All these things harm you, but they have no value in helping you in your relationship with God. So what do you do if you want to be closer to God? Well, accept Christ into your heart if you haven't already. But if you have and you're still having these feelings, then spend time with God in prayer. Spend time with God in worship. Get in tune with God. So when you do mess up because you will, you can feel God's loving arms wrap around you and you experience the love of a true father who loves you and says that he forgives you and it's time to get on the right path. That's the hope that we have in Jesus. Conviction helps us understand how we've done wrong and it leads us to God. Condemnation has us understand what we've done wrong and it leads us to feeling bad about ourselves and awful and terrible and then we stay there. I want a conviction in my heart. I want God to reveal the things that aren't right in me so that I can know that so that I can more honor God with who I am. Karen, if you could come forward this morning and uh, play softly on the piano. Uh, as we understand all this about God, today you might feel like you are separated from God. Maybe you have that condemnation and you're saying, okay, yeah, I know I've not been living my life for God. I feel like I, I'm separated from Him and I feel condemned right now. If you're feeling condemned right now, you don't have to feel that way. Let me help you understand what God's Word says. All of those things are of no value in stopping the self-indulgence. Nothing Nothing on this earth will help you to stop indulging yourself in the things on this earth. Jesus, the freedom that you have in Christ, gives you the freedom you need to stop the things of this world that are separating you from God. So, with that being said, you maybe feel dead in your trespasses, as this chapter said today. But if you accept Christ, God can make you alive in Christ. You don't have to live feeling dead anymore. You can be set free and made whole. The message is still the same all these years later. Jesus died for your sins on the cross. Everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's glory, it says in Romans 3. But the gift that you have is access to God. Access to God in Christ. You can be in line with God today as you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. As we think about this, would you just close your eyes and bow your head and just... Take a moment to just refresh. Take a moment to just renew. And just reflect on what the Word of God was speaking to us today in Colossians 2. If you want to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior and stop your life of sin and separation from God, I just invite you to raise your hand for just a moment this morning so we know that you want to accept Christ. And this is just a moment between you and God. 
we just want you to take a moment and just put your hand in the air and then put it right back down. And we're not going to make you come forward today to pray with you or anything like that. If you want to come forward after church, we pray for you. That's just fine. But I'm not going to make you do that in this moment. I just want to ask, is there anyone who wants to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior? And if you do, just put your hand in the air and we'll include you in this closing prayer today. If we could just have our entire church body repeat after me as we pray a prayer of accepting Christ. Just repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner and I ask that you forgive me of my sins. I believe that Jesus died on the cross and that he rose from the dead. Help me to turn from my sin and live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We are so grateful for those who have accepted Christ today. And I just want to share with you, by the way, I didn't see any hands raised, but if you didn't raise your hand and you still did accept Christ, I want to let you know about some next steps we have for you. We have what's called the New Believer's Handbook we want to put into your hands today, okay? And uh, we're going to hook you up with a discipleship partner, if you so choose, and uh, just bring you through what it looks like in your walk with God. We want to encourage you in, in your walk with God and make sure that you're not leaving today making a decision and then not knowing what that was all about. So we want to give you more info on that. But before you leave, just talk with me because I'd love to, love to encourage you. Um, I'd also like to close in prayer for any other folks uh, who are going through uh, some difficult times today. Um, I do know of some folks that are with us today that are going through some major struggles right now. Um, just give you a um, brief synopsis here. Uh, Jim Brody's uh, father... Uh, was just diagnosed with cancer and given just a few months to live. And so we want to pray for his father, uh, Dave, today. And then um, also Walt Wickham's sister, is also Catherine Hostetler's sister, uh, Betty, had a stroke this last week, and uh, she was sent home on hospice. And so uh, it, it's been a lot of loss in, in the Wickham family lately with uh, both our, our dear sister Deanna going on to be with the Lord and then uh, a sister-in-law of Walt and now, um, you know, Betty going on hospice. So just a lot going on lately. And uh, if you have any other prayer needs, uh, just lift those up to the Lord today as we pray. Would you join me in prayer? Dear God, we do pray for Jim Brody's dad, Dave. We just pray for healing of his cancer. God, he is a 94-year-old man who loves you. And he recognizes that he is ready to go be with you. But Lord, we pray for a healing in his life today. That he wouldn't have to suffer with any type of cancer or any type of treatment. But that you would heal him right now in Jesus' name. We have faith in our God who is our healer. We pray that you would heal Dave today of any cancer that is in his body. We also pray for Jim and Michelle as well, that you would encourage them and Ella and the rest of the family. We just pray that you would comfort their hearts as they're going through this with Jim's dad. I pray that you give them strength today. Give them hope today. Let them know, God, that their church family is surrounding them and supporting them. God, we pray for Betty, Walt's sister. We pray, Jesus, that you would heal her today and that she would have clarity of mind and the effects of the stroke, I pray that they would be gone in Jesus' name. I pray you bring comfort to her heart today and also for Walt and for Catherine and the rest of the family here with us today. God, I pray a, a peace that would surround them. God, they are going through immense loss in their life. God, in just in this last few months, three, two people have passed away and one on hospice. God, this is so difficult and I just pray that you would strengthen them and uphold them. God, for the rest of the needs that are in here today, I just pray your peace and that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, we pray that you would give strength to those who are in, in a time of need and are struggling today. And we just pray, God, that you would help us as we look at the truth of your word today and setting our minds on Christ and recognizing the truth of not doing things that are self-indulging, not doing things that are of this world that may think that we might get closer to you, but doing our life according to your word and according to your word alone. God, I pray that you would help us to live for you this week. Help us not to deviate from the path and help us to share Christ with all other people. We pray this in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. Amen. As you go today, I just encourage you, give your congratulations to Kristen on your way out. And also our next gen team meeting lunch is starting in just a few minutes on our lower level. God bless you. Have a great week and we'll see you soon.